welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Hey, we're going to have a great time in the Word of God today. Listen, you didn't come to hear from a man or a woman, from the young or the old, from the black, the white, the brown, or any other color you could imagine. Came to hear from God. And so if you would today, let's stand to your feet if you have the ability. I'm going to get down on my knees. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. And also today, let's uh, lift up our brothers and sisters in the Philippines. Many of you have heard about the typhoon. And we do have some missionaries that are on the ground doing some things there. We'll talk about that a little bit more later on in the church service. But let's go before the Lord in prayer together today. Father, we come to you today in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful we get to come freely into your house, lift up our hands, worship, and praise you, God. Thank you, Lord, that we can come into the house of God and experience your presence, God. We don't take that lightly. We don't take it for granted, God. We come to your presence, God, to hear from you. Lord, we would ask for our brothers and sisters in the Philippines, God, that you encourage them and bless them, God. Send relief and aid to them, God. Raise up your church, God. We pray that you bless your church and give grace, God. And may they be a shining light and a beacon of hope, God, in a dark time, in a dark place right now, Lord. We pray, God, that you would uh, just be strong and mighty, God. May the everlasting arms come and wrap yourself around those that are mourning, those that are hurting, God. Heal those that are wounded or sick, God. We thank you, Father God, that you rebuild churches and houses. Most of all, God, that you rebuild lives there, Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you bless the missionaries and the Christians and the churches that are there, God, doing your work, God. We thank you, Father God. Today, Lord, as we come into the house of God, we come to hear from you. Holy Spirit, come and be our teacher, be our guide. Give us the wisdom and the vision, the direction, motivation, the encouragement, even the instruction and the correction that we need for our lives, God. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Come open our eyes to see, our ears to hear, our hearts to understand. As we open your word, God, we pray that you open it up to us and open us up to receive it, Lord. Come and bless us with your ministry, Holy Spirit, and be the teacher of the church. Lord, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it for all of our brothers and sisters here in the Inland Empire as well as around the world. Lord, we love them. At no time do we think of ourselves better than anybody else, but we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. Jesus, mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say? Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Grab your Bibles. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. I'd like to welcome those of you that are online on our live stream. Uh, you can follow along with your Bible, too, right where you're at all over the world. I want to mention my wife, Pastor Jess, is watching my live stream right now. Hi, honey. I love you. Mwah. Yeah, she's not feeling too well. She's got the kids at home, so I uh, appreciate any prayers that go up for her. But uh, I'm not going to let that stop me. We're not unaware of the devil's tricks, and so that's just a stupid devil, right? And so um, we're not going to allow that to stop the Word of God. God is good. God is good. Hebrews chapter 7. You there? Three of you are. How about the rest of you guys? You guys there? Hebrews chapter 7? Okay, good. Thanks for showing up. Hebrews chapter 7. <laughs> My goodness. We've been in the Word of God, Hebrews chapter 7, talking about this guy by the name of Melchizedek. For those of you that are just joining us, we go line upon line, precept upon precept. What does that mean? That means that we go through the Word of God verse by verse. Why? Because when it was originally written, there wasn't chapter in verse like we see today. It was one continuous letter, one continuous thought. And so if God wrote it that way, we ought to be able to understand it that way. And so we've been building principle upon principle. Now we've come to this man by the name of Melchizedek who we first see in Genesis. The only other time you see him again in the Old Testament is in the book of Psalms in a prophetic utterance. And now all of a sudden in the book of Hebrews, we find out that God took this seemingly obscure man there in the Old Testament and built the entire priesthood of Jesus Christ upon the Melchizedek priesthood. Amazing. Talking about king of righteousness, king of peace. So many things. The unending life, no beginning, no end. How he brought uh, bread and wine. All these things that we've been talking about this man, Melchizedek. Last time we talked about how there was a changing of the guard. That there was a new priesthood. Therefore, there was a new law that was going to come and be instituted in our life. And now today with these thoughts in mind, Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to take a look at verse number 20 through verse number 24. Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 20 starts out and says this. And inasmuch as he, speaking of Jesus was not made a priest without an oath. In other words, we know about people getting into an office and they receive an oath before they start in that office, right? President of the United States of America, what does he do? He lifts his right hand and and places his hand on the Bible and then he says, I solemnly swear to uphold this office, right? And, And he goes on to say the things that he's going to do while he's in that office. Jesus, in the same way, had an oath that was spoken before he became high priest. Verse 21, for they, speaking of the high priest and the Levitical priesthood, have become priests without an oath. But he, capital H, with an oath by him, capital H, who said to him, now hold on a second, because that's a whole lot of he's and him's and capital H's, right? So we got to find out what we're talking about here. So it says that there were earthly priests, mortal men, who in the lineage of Aaron, who had come, and they just became priests. Why? Because they were in the lineage. 
They were part of the genealogy. They were the son or the grandson, and they were raised up so that when the high priest died, now all of a sudden, because they were next in line, they succeeded the high priest, and they became the next priest to minister before the Lord in the sanctuary. But then it goes on to talk about Jesus, and it says, but he, with an oath, by him, speaking of God the Father, who said to him, speaking once again of Jesus. So God speaks to Jesus, and he says something. Look at this. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. Some of your translations say he will not repent. What does that mean? That means that God has sworn something. God has stated an oath. And now God will not turn away from it. Repentance means I was going in this direction, and then I changed my heart and mind, and now I'm going to go in this direction. I'm going to go do a 180 and now go the opposite direction. So God says, this is the direction we're going. The Lord has sworn, and he will not relent. He's not going to turn away from it. He's not going to get off of it. He's not going to do anything else. He's going to go in this direction. What is that direction? You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, we've read this verse many times here in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it's quoted several times in chapter 5, chapter 7. Before this, this is the first time that we see that the Lord has sworn and will not relent. Verse 22, by so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Now, we know that the old covenant was good, but now Jesus comes and he has become the surety of a better covenant. Surety also, you could say, a guarantee. We'll come back to that thought a little bit later. Verse 23, also there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. So see, we know that the earthly priests, these mortal men, they couldn't continue on. Why? Because they died. And therefore, it had to get passed on from person to person throughout the generations. Verse 24, but he, speaking of Jesus once again, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. See, Jesus isn't going anywhere. His high priesthood will never change. Why? Because he has the power of an endless life. And God secured this oath of the covenant by himself in that Jesus was the surety. Jesus was the guarantee. See, if you take a look at the context of what we're talking about, this is written to Hebrew believers. This is written to people who understood the old covenant. And, and, and back in these times, there were not written contracts like we have today. You know, when we go and buy a car, a house, or something like that, or we go into a, a legal agreement, we, what do we do? We have written down documents that state everything, a lot of legalese that we don't even understand, and we sign on the dotted line, that sort of a thing. And, and what does that do? That settles the debate. We're now in contract. Why? Because we've signed that. But back in these times, an oath between two people was a binding social force. In other words, if someone came along and said, I'm going to do something, they say, how do I know that you're going to do it? And they say, well, I will swear an oath that I'm going to do it. Now, that oath settled the dispute because now they have said, I promise and I swear that I will do this. Now, someone may come along and say, well, hey, wait a second. I don't know you. There's no one around. You say you're going to do this, and yet, what's the guarantee? So what? You swore an oath. And what they would do is they would swear by something greater, or they would swear by something more permanent or more lasting than themselves. In the Bible, you can read about this, where you find that people swore, and as they swore an oath, they set up a pillar, or they set up a stone, or something like that. Why? Because that stone was lasting. That stone was greater. That stone was something that would be there for a long time so that if they ever said, hey, so-and-so's not fulfilling his part of the bargain. Well, how do you know that he said that? Well, let me show you. And they'd take you over. See this stone? We swore on this stone, and we said that we were going to do this, and now he's not upholding to his part of the bargain. See, so they would swear by something greater. You find Jesus talks about people that swore by the temple. It was greater. They would swear by the gold of the temple. They would swear by the altar. They would swear by the sacrifice on the altar. Why? Because they were saying, they were solidifying or securing the commitment. The greater or more permanent the object, then the more lasting and secure the oath. You guys all got that? Okay, clear as mud? Good, because I need you to track with me today because everything that we're talking about right now, we're going to build on throughout this message. So the greater or the more permanent the thing that they swore by the more secure the oath. This was called surety, okay? Surety. Surety meaning a guarantee. Now, we've all bought stuff, right? Maybe, maybe recently you bought some brake pads or something like that, and they had a guarantee, 60,000 miles. So when you get to 59,999 miles, what happens, and they wear out, you can take them back. Why? Because you have a guarantee that says these will last for 60,000 miles. So you take them back and you say, I want my money back. They wore out. Uh, I almost crashed on the highway, and therefore they're going to take care of you. Why? Because they guaranteed them. There was a sticker on the box that said, we're going to do this to our own hurt. And Jesus now becomes the guarantee. Why? Jesus secures the promise because he has the ability 
to fulfill it. Are you listening? See, that's the power of his endless life, is that Jesus, in the fact that he died and was raised again, he dies no more. Therefore, as he is standing at the right hand of the Father, now he guarantees to us that God will fulfill every promise. And that we can live with him in eternity. Why? Because he is our high priest seated at the right hand of God. And he's never going to die. He's never going to pass away. His ministry never fades. And the fact that he stands at the right hand of God is witness to that oath. Now, we heard last week that the law was good. Remember last week? Can we rewind our thinking a little bit? Last week, we talked about the law. We said that the law was good. There was a provision for sin, a standard for life, and a promise, a blessing that all came with the law. You remember there was a sacrificial system that took care of sin in our life. That's good. That's a good thing. Thank God that he did that. Also, we found out that the law had a standard of life. Thank God for standards. Thank God that God said, thou shalt not kill. Otherwise, people would be killing everybody, and there would be no accountability. It would be anarchy. And so God set up these things that were all good. Uh, a blessing. There was a blessing in the old covenant. God said, if you do these things, then you're going to be blessed. And there was a blessing attached to that covenant, and the blessing was good. Think about it. Blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed coming, blessed going. Everything you put your hands to, you shall prosper. You will come at your enemies in one direction. They will flee from you in seven. Right? All of the blessings of the old covenant. We like all that stuff. That was all good. But we have seen from this text, though, that God was not content to leave us with good enough. Are you hearing what I'm saying today? See, God swore an oath, and he would not relent. He wouldn't get off of it. God couldn't stand to have us stay at okay. He swore and would not change his mind. He wanted not the good, but he wanted the best. The existing system had to give way to something better. Today, I want to talk to you about securing a better life. That's the title of today's message, is securing a better life. See, Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is now the surety. Jesus is the guarantee. And Jesus, as our high priest, standing at the right hand of God, now for us becomes a dual surety of a better life. What do I mean by that, a dual surety? Well, he's a surety to us. He's a guarantee to us that God who promised is faithful. And God will fulfill every promise of his word. Think about it for a second. All the promises of God, the Bible says, are yes and amen in him. Therefore, if we are in Christ Jesus now, everything that God said, eternal life, blessing, health, prosperity, uh, a blessed life, blessed family, blessed children, blessed business, everything in our life, all of that now comes to us. Why? Because it is secure in the heavens by Jesus Christ himself. He is our high priest interceding on our behalf. He is the security to us that God will come through and God will do what he said he would do. God is faithful. But on the other end, there is that dual surety that I talked to you about. There's another piece to this, another side to this. What is that side? He's a surety to God of our transformed lives and that he will preserve us blameless until his coming. Are we going to mess up? Oh, sure. Are we going to have trials? Yes. But Jesus will preserve us and keep us by the power of his blood, by the power of his unending life, by his resurrection power until he comes to get us. See, it's in this sense of surety that we're talking about right now that we have some modern day examples that we can, we can take from. Maybe you've heard of posting bail, all right? San Bernardino, everybody say amen. Yeah, I heard about posting bail. I just did it last, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But posting bail, what is that? So many messes up, right? They go out there and they commit a crime. They get locked up, taken to jail. They get that one phone call, so they call you up and they say, Hey, bro, can you help me out? I'm in jail. And I need you to post bail for me $100,000. So what do you do? You say, Oh, man, this is my relative. This is my close brother and friend. I, ah, man, middle of the night, you get up, you scrape together everything that you have, and you go and you spend your money because they messed up to secure their release. Is that right? Okay, that's posting bail. We understand that. How about this? In that sense, yes, we can understand that. We can say, yeah, Jesus posted our bail. We messed up. We weren't doing the right thing. And therefore, Jesus came and he took our punishment. He, he paid our debt. He turned away the wrath of God from us by going to the cross. And now he secures our release from sin and death. So we get that and we understand that. But there's another modern day sense that we could talk about when it comes to a surety. What is that? Well, Jesus is a surety to us in the sense of co-signing, co-signing alone. Now, any, any parents of teenagers, right, that, that say, yeah, my daughter, my son, 
they wanted to go and buy a car and they didn't have any credit, so what did you do? You went down to the dealership and they picked out that shiny red car and you said, no, you're not going to get that shiny red car. See this old blue dump? That's what we're going to get, okay? And so you take them over to that as a Volvo because, you know, no one's ever died and so you're going to go with that one. So you, you take them down and what do you do? They signed their name, but on their own, they couldn't afford it and, and they didn't have any credit and therefore you co-sign for them in order to make that secure. That loan is now secure. Why? Because if they don't pay, you're going to pay. Is that right? See, that's another sense of co-signing. Jesus is the surety to us. Now, I want you to keep these thoughts in mind, and I want you to go with me to Luke, the 10th chapter. Because in Luke, the 10th chapter, we find a parable that Jesus spoke that I think beautifully describes what we're talking about today. Luke, the 10th chapter, if you will. Let me set the stage for you while you're turning there. Luke, the 10th chapter. Jesus is speaking, just like Jesus. Jesus is the word of God. He's always talking. He's always saying something. I love that. Jesus is preaching. Jesus is ministering. Jesus is healing. And here we find Jesus, and he's talking to somebody who's a lawyer. Now, not a lawyer in our sense of what we think about a lawyer, but the lawyers back in these times, they knew the law. They knew the, the word of God. They knew the scriptures. And what they would do is that they would interpret the law for the people. God said this, and he means this. This. And so here, Jesus is talking. A lawyer comes to him and asks him a question. He says, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the Bible? Right? It kind of sounds familiar from last week. We were talking about this. And, and so Jesus does something very interesting. He turns the question around back into another question, back to the lawyer. Don't you just love how God does that? You ever ask God, God, why? God says, well, you tell me why. Right? What's God doing? He's trying to get us to think. Trying to get us. He knows the answer. It's not that God doesn't know the answer. It's that God wants us to think. God wants us to get on his thought process, not our thought process. So God looks beyond the intent. God looks beyond the surface level. And now God says, here, here he says, what is the greatest command? And Jesus says, well, what do you read in the law? How do you interpret it? See, it's very important for us as Christians to understand what Jesus is saying. We all know the Bible. We all know what the Bible says. Many of us could quote scriptures. Many of us could tell you what the word of God says. But where the rubber meets the road is in the application of of the scripture to our lives. How do you interpret it? When you read the word of God and you know what the word says, how does that directly apply to your life? How do you interpret it? See, there's one interpretation, many applications to our life. Are you listening? So here he responds and, and the lawyer's taken aback, but he says, oh, well, 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 uh, 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 love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have answered rightly. Now, if it was me, I would have said, yeah, I answered rightly. Hey, all right, cool. All right, look at me, Mr. Big Shot. The teacher said I was right. But the lawyer, eh, no, he doesn't stop there. He says he wants to justify himself. So he says, and Jesus, who's my neighbor? See, we got to go back to the Jewish mindset at the time. Anybody who was not a Jew was outside of the covenants of God at that time. They did not have the law. They did not have a covenant with God. They did not have a relationship with God, and therefore they were considered Gentiles. And these Gentiles were outcasts to the Jews, even though God had told them you need to be kind to the foreigner and the stranger that's among you. They, they, they kind of had this pride and this arrogance like, you know, we've got the covenants. You don't have any of it. You guys are outside. Then there was another group that they were really mean to, which was the Samaritans. Samaritans were half-breeds, Jew that had intermarried with the nations around them. And so they were really mad at them because you're a traitor, okay? And so they were outcasts. They wouldn't even walk through their territory to get where they needed to go. They would go around their territory. That's how much they had been mean to these people and had kept them outside, okay? So here, this lawyer who is a Jew asked Jesus, the teacher, after saying that I should love my neighbor as myself, who's my neighbor? Jesus answers with this response. Remember, we're talking about surety, talking about a guarantee, talking about posting bail, talking about co-signing. Let's take a look at it together. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse number 30. You guys there? Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Jesus answered and said, a certain man. Everybody say a certain man. Certain oh, come on. Everybody say a certain man. Certain there you are. A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Everybody say half dead. See, there was a certain man. It could have been any man. It could have been a Jew. It could have been a Gentile. It could have been a Samaritan. It could have been anybody. And this certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Okay? Somebody was journeying, 
and now fell among thieves. The Bible says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Who's that talking about? The devil, right? And so we find that a certain man, any man, could have been going through life and fell among thieves. Here comes the devil, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, when we see Adam and Eve in the Bible, and they encountered this same thief, the devil, what happened? The, what did the devil do? He stripped them of their clothing, right? Their robes of righteousness. Now, all of a sudden, they were naked in their own eyes after they had been deceived and entered into rebellion, handing over the devil their righteousness, their ability to have a right standing with God and their authority here on the earth. And so now the devil wounds them, right? Because the devil knew that God said, in the day you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. But we know that they didn't fall over physically dead, so something else took place. There was a spiritual death that took place. There was a separation from God, and now they were only half dead. Maybe you didn't know this about yourself, but before Christ, you were half dead. Oh yeah, you were alive physically, walking around, but spiritually, all of us before Christ were dead, leaving him half dead. Next verse, verse number 31. Let's take a look at it. Now by chance, certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, passed by on the other side. So what happens? Here comes a priest. Priest represents the sacrificial system. Sees this man in a wounded position, doesn't do anything, but just passes by on the other side. Remember, the Bible said the law was weak and unprofitable. It could not help us in our sinful condition, couldn't help us in our wounded position. Maybe it was that the priest, you know, knew that he would be ceremonially unclean if he went and helped this man out, and he had responsibilities in the temple that day, so he passed by on the other side. Verse number 32 comes along and says, Likewise, a Levite. Now, the Levite, remember, not all Levites were priests. Okay, but all priests were Levites. So here a priest came by, but now a Levite comes by. A Levite, what is that? Well, that's the religious system. Here comes the Levite. Here comes the one who does the ordinances. Here comes the one who does the rituals. Here comes the one who helps out in the temple and makes sure that the wicks are trimmed on the candle, makes sure that the bread's on the table, makes sure everything's in order, makes sure everything's taken care of. Sacrifices are in order. People are in order. See, the, the religious system came along, and look what happened. And when he arrived at that place, came and looked. Came and looked. Religion takes a moment and stops by. Have you noticed that? Religion will stick around for a little while. It feels good. It feels nice. Thank you for visiting religion right? And, and, and it will hang out for a bit. We'll go through the motions. We'll go through the processes. And yet, look at what happens and pass by on the other side. See, religion can't help us. Religion's not going to make it. Religion's not going to do it for us. We need something else. Verse 33, but a certain Samaritan. Everybody say Samaritan. Samaritan. Remember, the Samaritans were the half-breeds. Samaritans were the outcasts. So a certain Samaritan comes by. When Jesus said this, I can imagine the lawyer going, oh, I see where he's going. This guy's not our neighbor, right? But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he does something unusual. He had compassion on him. We'd have thought the priest would have done that. We'd have thought the Levite would have done that. And yet, it took somebody who was an outcast to come to where he was. See, Jesus is that great Samaritan. For us, he's a half-breed. You say, what are you talking about? Because he was all God, and yet his deity fused with humanity and became all man. He is the God-man. He is a half-breed. All God and all man in one. Jesus Christ. He came to where we were. He didn't stay in glory. He didn't stay far away. No, he came to us. And when he saw us, he had compassion. Jesus was moved with what he saw in his heart. Now, let's take a look at what the verse goes on to say. Look at this. He had compassion. Verse 34. So he went to him bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. See, Jesus came to us in our time of need. Jesus came to us in our brokenness. Jesus comes and he pours on oil, the Holy Spirit, and wine, the blood of Jesus, which cleanses us from all sin. And it says, and he set him on his own animal. What does that mean? Well, it means that the good Samaritan picked this guy up and put him on his horse or on his mule or whatever he had with him. See, we couldn't save ourselves. We couldn't get ourselves out of the position that we were in. We were half dead. We were broke down, busted and disgusted, laying in a ditch, waiting to die. And yet, here comes Jesus, and he picks us up, not in our strength, but in his strength. And he sets us on his vehicle, his own animal, and now he gets us to where we need to be. Set him on his own animal. Look at this, and brought him to an end. Took care of him. Wow, look at what Jesus does. Verse 35, on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, take care of them. Whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. Isn't that amazing? So he not only secured our bail, 
Remember what we're talking about. Jesus is the surety as our high priest, the great high priest, representing God to man and man to God. He's the only one who can do that because he is the God-man. He is that great Samaritan. He is the half-breed that now represents us to God and God to us. And now he pays our bail. Here you go. Here's his bill. I've paid it in full. But look at what else he does. He says, and when I come again, I will repay you. You ever been to a hotel? And you, you went into the hotel, and, and as you're getting situated, you're putting your bags down, and then you look over, and there's that little refrigerator. You open that refrigerator up. What's in there? $4 waters? <laughs> $3.50 candy bars and M&Ms, right? And, and you say, oh, no, 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 no. Too much. Then you go and you open up the book, and it's got the sites and all that kind of stuff, and the room service, and you start looking at what eggs and bacon cost, and you think, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to take out a loan just to get breakfast in this place. Let's go find a Denny's somewhere, right? And you close it up, and you, and you say, kids, don't touch anything. I don't want you to get away from the fridge, right? All we're doing is going to the pool. That's free, okay? <laughs> what does he say? He says, take care of him, whatever more you spend. If he orders room service, if he grabs a candy bar, an M&M, a water, and then he orders some room service and a massage, when I come again, I will repay you. Wow. See, Jesus secures a better life for us. Jesus secures a better life for us. What Jesus secures, a couple of things quickly today that we're going to run through and take a look at. What Jesus secures for our lives as our surety, as our guarantee. What are the things that he secures? What are the things that we can understand? Number one today is he secures a better outcome. Better outcome for our lives. Just as the Good Samaritan was not content to leave a man half dead, Jesus couldn't leave us in our sinful condition. Now, not only that, he still gives help to us every day. In other words, you don't have to go through life and only have the good outcome in heaven. Are you listening? See, sometimes we as Christians, we, we think, oh, I'm going through a problem. God must not be interested in my everyday life. He's only interested in my eternal life. And therefore, this natural stuff, God can't be bothered with that. And therefore, I'm going to have to just be broke down, busted, and disgusted. I'm going to have to be sick. I'm going to have to be wounded. My marriage is going to have to stink. My kids are going to have to go astray. Why? Because someday in the sweet by and by, I'll fly away and go to be with God in glory. And then it'll be okay. And yet God never said, I want you to live that way here on the earth. God said, I want better outcomes in your everyday life. Wow. God wants you to have a better marriage. God wants you to have better children. God wants you to have a better business. God wants you to be a better employer or employee. God wants you to be a better neighbor. God wants you to be out there in the community having a better witness. See, God is interested in every area of your life, and he wants to get all up in your mix, if I can use some San Bernardino terminology today. Hello? Hello? interested in our lives, a better outcome. It doesn't have to end the way of the world or the way of the enemy. Let's go for God's outcomes. That means what? You find in the word of God what God says about your life. You latch onto that. You take hold of it and you bring that into your life. You confess it over yourself. You work it. You eat the word of God. You breathe the word of God. You sleep the word of God. You say the word of God. You talk the word of God. You live the word of God. And then as you do that, you get God's outcomes, better outcomes doesn't have to be just good in your life. It can be better. I love what Andrew Murray says. He said, faith must see what God promises and then allow God to fulfill the promise in us. See, as you get a hold of the word of God and you see the promise of God, then you start to believe him, start to declare it, start to work it in your life, and then allow the grace of God, the ability of God to move on the inside of you. Let's take a look at this in the word. Romans, you're there in the book of Luke. Turn a couple books over past John and Acts to the book of Romans. We're going to go to Romans chapter number 5. Romans chapter number 5. Everybody doing okay? Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Romans chapter 5, verse number 1, verse number 2 says this. Romans chapter 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith. What does that mean, justified? When you're justified, it's just as if I'd never sinned. Okay, that'll help you to remember what justified means. It means in the high courts of heaven, the gavel has come down and declared you to be not guilty. In other words, you are now justified. Jesus posted your bail and he secured your release. You are no longer that old sinner. Now you are a saint because you've been justified. It's just as if I'd never sinned. Look at what it goes on to say by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, we're talking about Jesus is the surety of a better outcome. See, before Christ... The Bible tells us that we were at enmity with God. Enmity, what is that? 
Really, what it means is war. We were at war with God in our nature. We were disobedient, rebellious. We didn't do the things that God wanted us to do. We went against our conscience. But now that we've given our heart and life to Jesus, Jesus has justified us by faith in Jesus Christ. We are now justified. We stand cleansed in the presence of God. The gavels come down. We're not guilty. And then what happens now? All of a sudden, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. But listen, there is not a period at the end of this sentence. There is a comma. That means the thought continues on to the next verse. Look at verse number two. Through whom? Who are we talking about here? Oh, come on. Come on. Who are we talking about here? Jesus. Jesus. Give me the Sunday school answer to everybody. Who are we talking about? Jesus. Oh, you guys went to Sunday school. I can tell. Jesus. Through whom we also have access by faith into this Grace, what is grace? God's sovereign, divine ability to get the job done on my behalf when I can't do it. So when you look at your life and you can see a certain outcome and you say, God, I'm headed in this direction. It doesn't look good. It doesn't look like the bills are going to get paid. It looks like the kids are going south. It looks like the husband or wife is left. It looks like the job is done. It looks like they're handing out pink slips. It looks like I'm broke. It looks like I'm not going to make it. But hey, listen, now all of a sudden you don't have to have that outcome. Why? Because you have access by faith into the ability of God when you can't do it in which we stand. That's where you live. Every day you live in the grace of God, the ability of God. But the verse isn't over. Look at what it says. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now we can say, well, that's some great Christianese. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. But what is he saying? We rejoice in hope. Hope is not just hope like the world. Oh, I hope God comes through. I hope that I make it. I hope that something happens. I hope that, you know, a golden goose comes and lays a golden egg on my lawn. Listen, not going to happen. We don't hope as the world hopes. We have a confident expectation. That's the biblical definition. When we see the word of God, it's the blueprint for our faith to go to work on. And now we have a confident expectation of what? The glory of God. What is the glory of God? The manifested goodness of God. Of God. That means in our lives, as we believe the Word of God, we allow the grace of God to work in us, we work with the grace of God, then we get the God outcomes and we can have joy, we can be happy, we can smile, we can laugh in circumstances because we know we have a confident expectation God's gonna come through, God's gonna do it, God's goodness is gonna be made manifest, open on display in my life. Hallelujah! I think I just preached myself happy. Well, Jesus secures, number one, a better outcome. Second thing Jesus secures is a better blessing. Better blessing. Remember we talked about this, that Samaritan, before he left, he said, if he has any other needs, if he has the end of the bills, when I return, I'm going to pay them. Right? Under the old covenant, there were promises of blessing. Remember, we talked about this, blessed in the city, blessed in the field. All of that was secured by the old covenant. But now we have a greater high priest eternal in the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, with the power of an endless life. Now Jesus is ascended to the right hand of God. And if there were good blessings under the old covenant, how much better the blessings under the new covenant? See, this is a better covenant with better blessings. Now, sometimes people turn off at this point and they say, are you just talking about money? See, I knew this church was all about money. That's what I heard and that's what I read. And you know why we say that? Because we've been fed two lies. You want to know what they are? First lie we've been fed is that, number one, it's all about money. That this is all about money, 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 money. God's only interested in your money. God wants your money. If you give your money, you'll get money, and then money, money, money. Okay? That's the first lie. Not all about money. It's all about Jesus. It's all about us living in Jesus. God will supply all of our need. Okay? God's going to take care of us. God's looking after us, and God can do that with or without money, however he chooses. Okay? So that's the, that's the first Lie. Second lie is this, that there's no money, okay? But that's foolish. Why? Because we live in this world. God placed us in the midst of this world, right smack dab in the middle of 2013. He put us here in this time, in this season. He put us here right in the middle of the world systems that use money. You work eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, right? And you work day in, day out to get what? Money to Bless your family to work, to eat food, to put clothes on your children, to put a roof over your head, to pour into the kingdom of God. See, it takes money to do those things. God is not so concerned with money or not money, but God wants us to take what we do have when it comes to money and bless him, and he will bless us. God will take care of it. And you say, Pastor, are you mad? No, I'm not mad. Maybe a little. Mad at the devil. Why? Because we've been fed these lies. 
I don't like lies. I like the truth. You know what the truth is? You want to know what the truth is? Well, let's take a look in the Word of God. That's where you'll find the truth. Turn to me the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Very familiar verses in Philippians chapter 4. You remember Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We love to quote that verse, but did you know that the context of that verse is talking about money, blessings, life? The Apostle Paul says, I've learned. I know what it's like to be full. I know what it's like to suffer need. I, I've, I've abounded and I've had lack. I've been clothed. I've been naked. But remember, we all could say this. I've been poor, broke, and I've been rich and had abundance. I want to go to the better, right? I've been sick, and I've been healthy. Healthy's better. Is that right? So I've been not blessed, and I've been blessed, and blessed is what? Better, right? So now here comes God, and God says, I want to give you a blessing under the new covenant. And that new covenant blessing is better. Old covenant was good. Old covenant was wealth, money, family, endeavors, all that kind of stuff. Future, destiny, everything was good. But now we're under a new covenant, better. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19. Look at this. And my God shall supply all your need. Did he say some? A little bit? A little dabble, do you? Just enough? Only for you and not for someone else? No. God said all. My God shall supply all your need. How? According to his riches in glory. Can I ask you, who's richer than God? <laughs> Nobody. He paves his streets with gold. That's the asphalt of heaven. So pure that it looks like glass you can see through it. On earth, we would be drooling and trying to chip away at the streets when they're like, are you trying to get some gum up off that? What are you doing? That's what we walk on. That's the dirty street. Get off of that. That's not valuable here. God, the Bible says that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. See, the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. That's our God, but that's also our Father. You are part of the family of God now. You are a king's kid. That means if your God is rich, then you are rich. How does he do it? Well, we didn't read the rest of the verse, did we now? Look at what it says. My God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ. Jesus, that means when you have a need, when you want the blessing, you go to your high priest, you take that need to Jesus, you take it to him in prayer, and Jesus intercedes on your behalf. You believe God, you stand on the word of God, stand on the Bible, find the promises of God that God is the God who gives us the power to get wealth, why that he may establish his covenant on the earth. God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his servants. See, God is interested in blessing every area of your life. Wife, husband, children, business, home, community, marketplace, every area of your life, God wants to bless you. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. Now, before you start thinking that this is a message all about money, better outcomes, better blessings, Last one for today, which I believe is the best one, better access. What Jesus secures in our life is a better access. See, the better outcome and the better blessing come through the access that we have now to God. In the old covenant, you think about it, there was a high priest that came, and he could only go into the presence of God on behalf of the people once a year and not without blood. Now, growing up in that sort of a system and sort of a society, you can imagine a young child that goes to the temple for the first time, and here he relates, here he sees, here he understands what's going on for the first time. He sees how his family has brought a sacrifice. They brought the lamb, and now that lamb goes to the high priest, and here's the high priest in, in, in his robes, and there he is, and he's got his turban on, and, and he slices that animal's throat and catches the blood in a basin, sets it aside. Then he goes and he burns the, the body of that sacrifice. He goes and he washes and he changes his clothes. And now look at him. Look at the, look at the turban now with the, the stones on it. Look at the ephod. Look at, look at his, his glorious garments. This guy is shining in his splendor. And now he's going into the presence of God. You can imagine the awe in this child. Growing up as a young adult into adulthood now, here they are week after week, day after day, and as they sin, as they mess up, they bring a sacrifice. And here the high priest, they have to confess their sins before the high priest. High priest examines the animal, and these were animals that meant something to these families. They meant provision. They meant that they could have traded with these animals. They could have gotten milk or cheese with these animals. They could have had meat with these animals, or they could have made more animals with these animals, right? And yet, because of their sin, they had to give this innocent life for their guilty one. 
So here comes the high priest, and they're confessing. You can imagine them crying over their sin and weeping, and the high priest sharing a tear, sharing a moment with them, bringing them in, saying, it's okay, God has given you a provision. And now he slits the throat and brings it before the presence of God, making atonement for their sin, a covering. Now as that same child who grew up into adulthood gets older, he hears word that the high priest has died, gone on, and now there's a new high priest. Probably didn't want to go to the temple anymore. Probably didn't want to go and relate with this new priest. Why? He doesn't know me. Doesn't know my story. Doesn't know my family. Doesn't know the things that I've gone through, the things that I've overcome, the sins. He hasn't shared any tears with me. Just young. I'm older than him. What's he going to do? How's he going to represent me to God? And yet, church, remember, we're not under that old covenant anymore. We have a better covenant with a better high priest, Jesus, who now because he has died and is raised again, he has the power of an endless life. You have a high priest who you have access to every moment of every day. The Bible says that you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So when you messed up or when you're going through something tough and when you need to talk, all you got to do is look over your shoulder and say, hey, Jesus, and you are there in the presence of God. You are under a better covenant with better access. Quickly, let me quote to you. 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22, now he who established us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. There's that guarantee. There's that surety one more time. Jesus gives us the spirit of God to live on the inside of us. You have God on the inside of you. Hebrews chapter 4, let's close with this. Hebrews chapter number 4 today, talking about a better access. You guys remember Hebrews 4? Been a couple years, but, you know, still good. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 14 through verse number 16. We'll close with this today. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 says this. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet was without sin. Can you imagine the high priest Jesus coming and wrapping his arms around you? He knows what you're going through. He knows where you've been. He has shed tears over you. He has wrapped his arms around you in the middle of the night while you cried. That's your king. That is your God. That is your high priest now who intercedes on your behalf. But look at this, verse number 16. Let us therefore come, how? Boldly to the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Not only did Jesus secure your ransom. Not only did he post your bail. No, Jesus released you and then he co-signed on your life and said, whatever you have need of, I will give it to you. You got to come and access me for the blessings and for the better outcomes. You got something from the word of God today. Come on, give God a great big praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. Remember, you've got access. Don't ever think you don't. Don't ever think you're too filthy, too dirty to come to God. Don't ever let that keep you from God. Don't ever think that God, you know, I can't talk to God in the middle of the night. He's probably sleeping. No, the Lord never sleeps or slumbers. God is right there with you waiting. The Bible says draw near to God. He will draw near to you. There's no limits, no restrictions on that. You get into the presence of God as often as you can. Live in the presence of God because you have access. Can you give God one more great big praise today? (laughs) Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to talk to the hundreds of people that got up and walked out. I know you can hear the sound of my voice out there in the foyer, out there on the breezeways, and in the bathrooms. Hello. I want you guys to listen up. Stop right where you're at. Listen up. If you're in the bathroom, finish what you're doing, then stop and listen up. Okay, come out in the foyer. But I want to talk to you. I want to make sure that before you leave this place, your heart is right with God and that you don't end up in hell that you go to heaven. Your eternal destiny is at stake. God is stopping everything right now to talk to you. Giving a clear call to those of you that have left already. We want you to stop and turn around and come back and listen. If you're in the breezeway, there's a stone bench right next to you. Sit down. Listen up. If you're in the foyer, stop right where you're at. Listen up. Look at the TVs. Give God some of your attention. Those of you that are inside, thank you guys for staying. I, I want to make sure you know this is not just for them. This is for you too. God is speaking to you right now. Don't let anything distract you. Don't hand out notes. Not time to text. Not time to talk or to get up and leave. Please, respect the move of the Holy Spirit right now. God wants to do something in this place. 
Why am I so serious? Because hell is a very real place and heaven is a very real place. I want to make sure that you end up in heaven and not go to hell. Another lie that we've been fed in these times is that hell is not real. And yet, Old and New Testament, the Bible talks about it. Jesus himself spoke of it. So let's not just think and be so naive that we can deny its existence and avoid going there. You're going to have to face it. You're going to have to make sure that you don't go there. Let's talk. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Sometimes people say, well, all roads lead to heaven. I stick to my truth. You do your thing. And we'll all get there somehow, some way. And yet, how foolish is that? We think that whatever we want to do, we can go to heaven. You think that God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one who wrote the plan of redemption, carried it out in his son Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross, you think that after doing all that, he'd say, okay, whatever you want to do, go ahead and do it. No. Jesus came and he said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man goes to the Father except by me. What does that mean? It means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Not going to get there your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We've got to get there God's way. Jesus made this statement. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know when people hear about that term born again, they turn off and they say, I heard about that on movies and TV and books and the internet on blogs. That's crazy weirdo stuff. I don't want to have any part of that. Yeah, let's not define being born again by what the world says or media or television, Hollywood, books or the internet. Let's define it by what the Bible says. What does being born again mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. Does it mean you go to church? No, you can go to church all you want. It never makes you a Christian headed for heaven. Does it mean you be good? No, you can't be good enough to get to heaven. It doesn't change your life. Does it mean you volunteer in church? No, you could volunteer until you're blue in the face. Not going to do you any good with regards to getting into heaven. You mean that you know who God is and you can quote scriptures? Celebrate Easter and Christmas? No, no, it doesn't mean that either. Because the Bible records that the demons and the devil himself know who Jesus is and can quote scriptures, and yet they're not Christians headed for heaven. What does being born again mean? It's always meant the same thing from the Bible. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's all or nothing with Jesus. We prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. He says, when I come, I want to find you hot, Or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Those are gross graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what's he talking about? Lukewarm, what's that? Well, it's a little in, little out, little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and then. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today... I'm going to give you an opportunity. In a moment, I'm going to count to three just like this. One, two, three. Bang! Pop my hands together when I say three. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang! That's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You, you might be thinking right now, whoa, whoa, wait a second. Wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Yeah. You might be embarrassed. It's okay. Let's get past that today. Because think of the trade-off. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Yet the devil thinks that you're a fool. He's going to try and talk you out of it. Your, your flesh is going to try and tell you, no, you'll be embarrassed. Don't do it. People are judging you. People are going to laugh at you. No, we're not going to laugh at you. We're going to smile with you. We've all done this at one point or another in one way or another. We're excited for you. We're rooting you on. We love you. That person that invited you today, they brought you here because they wanted to see this happen in your life. Okay? No games. No tricks. Just you and Jesus right now. Have you given them all of your heart? Have you given them all of your life? Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, today make sure. Who should raise their hand? You've never done this. Never said yes to Jesus, giving them all of your heart and life. Come on, I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in your heart? You know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Come on, you can make a right relationship with Jesus Christ in a moment by acknowledging your need for Jesus, raising your hand. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, wherever you're out watching by television, in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, and the breezeways out there, come on. Hey, you can raise your hand, then tell an usher or come into the church service right afterwards. Online, you want to respond to God right now? Hey, you can raise your hand. God is watching. And then either go to our homepage. If you're on your mobile device, click uh, How to Know God. Or if you see the blue button there that says Respond to God, click that right now and someone will lead you in a prayer. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. 
This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Thank you. Thirteen. God bless you. Who else today? Thirteen wise people already. Thirteen. Fourteen up on top. Gotcha. Thank you. Fourteen wise people. Fifteen in the family room. Thank you. Sixteen in the family room. God bless you on this side. Sixteen. Seventeen up top. Gotcha. Thank you. Eighteen over here. Nineteen. Thank you. Where you at? Over here. Number twenty. Thank you. God bless you. Who else today? You need to give God all of your heart. You need to give God all of your life that I didn't already see. About tw- thank you, 21. Thank you. I think I got you already. About 21 wise people. If that's you, come on real quick. Just pop your hand up when I'm looking in your direction. Anybody else? About 21 wise people. If you know that's you, come on. Will you give God all of your heart? Will you give God all of your life? Anybody else real quick? Come on. Thank you, 22. God bless you. Who else today? Who else today? You're saying, yeah, I need to do this. Let's go for God today. If that's you, quickly, quickly, quickly. Come on. Come on. Don't miss this opportunity. If that's you, just raise your hand up high. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you. Got you right there. God bless you. Who else today? 23, 24. Got you. Thank you. 25. Thank you. Who else today? Come on. Let's go for God if that's you. Anybody else? All right. Let's give the Lord a hand for 25 wise people today. Hallelujah. Here's what I want you to do. All 25 of you or the other five that should have raised your hand but you did not too late. If you're out there in the foyer, time to come in. Come on. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Get your stuff, whatever you brought with you to church. Once you get in the aisle and meet me up front. No one leave during this time. Very rude. You know, we're trying to get people forward. They're going to follow you that way if you go that way. So let's let them come forward. We're all going to stand. We're all going to sing a song, give a clap and a shout. As we do that, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front. You come right now. Come on, let's welcome them. You come. Come on down. You're all I want. Come on, come on, come on. You raise your hand or you should have. You come. You're all I've ever needed. From the family rooms, you can bring your children down. You're Ushers, let's help them. They're coming. Help me know you are near. That's you. You need to come. Just make your way to the front right now. Give a hand. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. They're still coming. They're still coming. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. Come on, come on, come on, come on. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Come on down. This is your time. This is your moment. Come on, come on. Wow, look at you guys. I think this is a bit more than 25. Praise God, praise God. Hey, you guys, you can put a smile on your face. It's a good thing, all right? Now listen, you came to give God all of your heart, came to give God all of your life. All right, I want to introduce you guys to my twin, right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Joel. He just forgot his black tie today, okay? He's cool, all right? I'm joking, by the way, all right? A really good guy, one of our pastors on staff. He's going to do three things. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance so you're not wondering what's going on, okay? First thing he's going to do, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again. Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, some free literature, a little booklet our pastor wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Thirdly, he's going to introduce you to a friend we have here in the church that we like to call a spiritual personal trainer or an SPT for short. Basically, it's a friend who will come alongside you for five weeks, teach you five things out of the Bible that will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy. It's free. He'll describe to you how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out, okay? All right, now listen. Let me make a promise to you guys. Give us a year of your life here at The Rock sitting under the teaching of the Word of God consistently. Come to church, in other words. Come hang out with us. Get involved and listen to the messages. Apply it to your life as you do. You're not just going to have a good life. You're going to go on to the better life that God has for you. Am I telling the truth, everybody? You guys will make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord 
and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.